So good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Let me thank the uh, organizers for the invitation to, to speak. Um, there are lots of uh, words in the title here. There's uh, not, not just neuro-symbolic, but the, the symbolic part is probabilistic and logic. And so it's, it's a mix. So I, I hope to talk about the symbiosis. And, and I, I, actually, the, the biological metaphor here is, uh, I think, is interesting because uh, this process of symbiosis is one where uh, different uh, organisms interact. There are many ways in this in, in which this can happen. They can benefit each other, which is mutualism. They can compete. There are other uh, ways uh, in which uh, things can 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 happen. Um, so I will try to explore a little bit uh, a few things that I hope will lead to mutualism. Um, and in the inter in the spirit of workshop, I instead of talking about things that are more technical in, in detail, in, in more detail. I just put the reference to, to papers and I'll try to give a broader overview um, <clears throat> of things that have been done by a number of people. You see many names here, I'll show photos later. Um, even a photo of Alex, Alex is here, but uh, in the interest of the, the people that are remote and they can see a photo. Um, so how do I, uh, man? So the taker. <laughs> okay. All right. So obviously we want mutualism, right? We want things to cooperate and benefit each other. There are many ways in which this is possible. Um, four years ago, there was a very nice talk by uh, Kotz and AAAI on the possible ways to, to, to have uh, neurosymbolic reasoning. Uh, Garces and, and Lam have uh, wrote about it. Uh, so I, I had some very simple pictures here of what can happen. So it may happen that symbolic system calls the neural system, or the neural system calls the symbolic system. Today, this is, there's lang chain all over the place, or maybe there's a pipeline, or maybe there are things that transform the sim symbols into structure or loss. We had a, a very nice talk before about uh, constraints loss, like right? constraint loss, which is which is about this. So there are many ways. So instead of perhaps of trying to explore all of this at this point where it's not really clear what the best formalism is, it's it's good to, to look at specific cases, specific applications and discuss and see what we can do with them, right? So in this talk, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be discussing an argumentation problem, right? And I, I hope to convince you that argumentation frameworks are very interesting objects to work with in the neurosymbolic uh, setting. And if I succeed in, in, in this, I'll be happy, okay? So it's it's very interesting problem. It's a very difficult problem. Uh, LLMs do not do well. Nothing does well at this point. So it's, it's very uh, challenging. Uh, also, I'll, I'll try to advocate that a neuroprobistic logic programming approach is, is reasonable. Uh, there may be other approaches, but this is one that I, I think is, is a reasonable one. And that it offers sort of an, a gluing formalism for all these uh, ideas. If there is time, but I don't think there will be time, but uh, if there is time, I'll talk about our, our package for neuro probabilistic logic programming, if, if there is time. So argumentation is a very key element of uh, human thought and human, the human experience, right? We, 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 we argue. Um, it's important in decision making, negotiation. It's one thing that makes us uh, human, and it's a very hot topic since uh, '95 within uh, knowledge representation community. Uh, in '95, there was a paper by Dung, which sort of organized a little bit the field in terms of uh, the formalism that can be uh, one formalism that can be used. Since then, there has been many different formalisms uh, proposed in the literature. The basic idea is very simple in Dunn's formalism is that you have arguments and they attack each other. Okay, it's, it's this simple. But it has a bit of it has a bit of a non-monotonic character in the sense that if you have an argument that is not attacked, you accept it. Okay, so it's it's a bit non-monotonic. So one example is like this. So uh, bus drivers are working. This is an argument. Okay, if it's not attacked, then you accept, and because you accept then you reject the argument that it's attacked by the first one, okay? And then if you, if you reject this, then you can accept the, the, the argument that is attacked by, by itself, okay? So it's, it's a, you have a graph, the graph has arguments, 
and the arguments attack each other. Okay, and you want to know which arguments survive, which arguments are accepted. Okay, uh, of course, this sounds simple. I, I hope I made it sound simple. But if you have a large uh, argumentation graph, it may be complicated. There are no monotonic aspects that have to be taken care of. So finding the accepted and reject arguments is, is not an easy problem. It's NP and some formulas, NP to NP and so on. Um, and also there are many variants. Okay, there are attacks, there are supports, there are probabilistic uh, argumentation graphs and so on. Okay. Uh, our problem, our goal, and this is the work of uh, Victor, which a uh, PhD student. You see, he's very happy to work with this. Uh, the, the work is to detect argument, to detect false arguments, okay? It, it, specific arguments that are generated, that may have been generated artificially. So the idea is, suppose you have uh, LLMs generating uh, political discourse, okay? We want to detect fake or false, incorrect arguments in their texts. There are other things you might do with argumentation. This is what he's doing, and this is what I will be talking about. One other thing that I think is very interesting in argumentation, I think it's probably more interesting still, but it's harder, a lot harder. And this is something that my colleague, Dennis Mala and a student, uh, Igor, uh, are, are looking at, is to evaluate arguments by students. Okay, so you're evaluating uh, writing, uh, text, the textual, um, uh, evaluating text, by students and you need to grade the text. But the thing is when you when you do grading, it's not enough just to give a, a number. You have to explain why the grade was, was given. And in fact, there's a very nice and very uh, influential study by these people here uh, uh, where they discuss the pros and cons of automated grading. And one thing they say that I think is very nice is that Practice measured by computer. So, for example, if you have, a, you can grade uh, writing by the number of words. Usually, the number of words is very correlated with the quality of writing for a student, you know, for a first grade student. Because you know, if if the person can write more, it's probably better. But the point is, the proxies such as this, measured by computer, are not what is really important. You don't want this. You want to to grade. You want to give the person an understanding of what's going on. Okay. So this is one possible application that, is, that I think is, is very nice. Uh, we're not doing this. We're, I'll, I'll not be doing, talking about this. Uh, I'll be talking about detecting fake arguments, okay? And this is one example. So um, in this case, we asked GPT to convince a person about some facts um, about the ruins of Troy and so on. And, and when you read the text, you see that there are several components. That's, that's the uh, technical word. Uh, some of them are premises, premises, you know, some of them are facts that uh, it's stating, some of which may make sense. Uh, well, they, they read, I mean, it's very fluent, right? But then the, the major claim, which is this, this claim, it is uh, supported by the, the premises, but actually it's self-contradictory, uh, okay? The, the, the major claim itself doesn't make sense. Um, so we want to detect this from the structure of premises and attacks and supports, whether things make sense. We're not trying to see, we're not trying to check whether this fact is correct, okay? This is another, another thing you could do, okay? Uh, th this is not something we, we invented. It has been proposed before. This has been discussed before. There's a paper, very, very nice paper by Galassi, Christian Kirsty, and, and colleagues uh, published in 2020, this is big data, that discusses the uh, uh, the importance of neurosymbolic methods in this setting, the argumentation setting, okay? And very recently, uh, Amaral Pinto and Martins, three researchers from Portugal, they, they published a very nice paper in, at APIA on using neurosymbolic methods to extract arguments from text and reason about them. So, so this is actually a very nice paper. Um, it's very similar in many ways to what we're doing. So what I'll be talking about you know, it's, there are many ways, possible ways, but I'll be talking about a, a, a pipeline where you get uh, oops, you get symbols. The you extract arguments, you extract components. Uh, some of them may be major claims, some of them may be uh, premises, uh, and then uh, you have a, an evaluation the quality of the argument. 
And then what you produce is a, a probability that the argument is, is consistent, okay, it's correct. Correct, I mean, it's, it's uh, the structure is correct. Okay, so when, so I'll spend a few minutes uh, th going through the really, really difficult uh, task of producing an LLM that does this well, and uh, perhaps you know this. So you have to get data, you have to pay people to label, you have to check manually everything, and then you run, you, you get a cluster of GPUs to run, and after many months you say, oh, this is easy. You know, the LLM is working. Okay, so this is, this is what happened. So uh, argumentation mining uh, is usually divided in three, three parts. First, you identify the components, then you, you classify the, whether it's a major claim, claim or not, it's a fact, and then you relate things. You say, well, this is attacking, this, this component is attacking the other one or supporting the other one. So this is one example from a well-known uh, data set. One problem is that there are not too many examples out there. There are uh, several data sets with a few hundred uh, examples of uh, labeled uh, arguments, labeled text, right? You're labeling components and attacks and supports. So actually what, and one problem with these, uh, these uh, data, existing data sets is that most of the arguments that are from people, there are good argumenters, right? So these are good arguments. So it's very hard to learn how to classify and say that the argument is bad argument. So we, we, we produced a, a data set with bad arguments. We, we divide between bad and ugly arguments. So many things there. Uh, this is work uh, with uh, Paulo and it was published uh, last year as well. So, and then we, we built a foundation model, if you will, for argumentation mining. <laughs> uh, so basically got all these data sets we got, um, so Victor took these data sets and tried several different uh, LLMs, Roberta, Longform, and you name it. Um, and he uh, did the training and he got pretty well. So this is the foundation model that uh, operating on spend detection, which is finding the components, uh, classifying with whether it's a major claim or not, uh, de detecting whether it's an attack or support, so uh, here, uh, whether there's a link and whether the link is a real. So it, it's, it's pretty good, right? And actually you might, you might ask, oh, did you try GPT? Yes, yes, we did. So uh, GPT and even fine tuning, so we can pay OpenAI to get your data and fine tune GPT in special way. So we did this. This was better than any prompting strategy that we could uh, imagine. Uh, even then uh, it didn't do well. Well. I mean, it's still very impressive that it does something, right? But it's it's a very hard problem. So um, finding the arguments and finding which which ones attack the other is it, really hard. And this is work with uh, Ryan and, and Alex. So, okay, so, and then, so this is the neural part. Okay, the neural part is extracting these things and you get all these arguments and notice that you get uh, probabilities associated with them. Because if you take the last uh, the decision of the neural networks and you do a softmax, you get the probability that this argument is a major claim or that this text is a major claim or not, the probability that it's attacking, the probability it's supporting. So you have probabilities for these things. Um, so the problem is how do you decide whether the whole, the whole mix of uh, components is, uh, is correct? It's, it's not a false, incorrect argument. So what we do is we... Um, translate all of these to a prop-log program. And this is similar in many ways to what uh, the previous talk by Brisa uh, said. Um, so we have this premise, major claims with probabilities. Uh, we want to decide whether a stated claim, something that was found in the text as a major claim, is actually, uh, has a high probability given the premises, okay? So we turn all of that into a, a logic program and we have a probabilistic logic program, and we ask a package similar to Problog. I'll, I'll talk about this later, but similar to Problog, if you know Problog, what is the probability of this major plane? And if the probability of the major plane, given everything else, uh, is, is larger than half, then you say, okay, it's really a major plane. Okay. If it's not, then, well, it's, it's a bogus argument, basically. 
okay? Everything else is not giving you a high probability for the thing you said is a major plane, okay? Um, so to do this, we we benefited from a, the, from one fact that is perhaps not well known, but uh, there is a very uh, simple equivalence between argumentation frameworks, these uh, structures where you have argument support and attacks. This has been studied for several years since '95, basically, um, and logic program, which is. Benjamin talked about this uh, quite a bit uh, in the previous talk. Uh, so you can take all these uh, elements of, uh, of the text, you, the things you extracted, and turn into a logic program. It's immediate, right? So I gave, I gave here a, a artificial example just to make it simple. So suppose you have all these, suppose you have this argumentation graph, and each one of these uh, nodes is, is an argument that has a conclusion and they attack or they support. I don't know if you can see the difference between the arrows, but some of the arrows are attacks, some of the arrows are supports. And you can take a, a, a graph like this, which is the thing you get out of the argumentation mining step, right? You have tracked everything, you have labeled everything, you, have, you know now which ones are attacks or supports, you have probabilities for these things. And you have this, and you transform into a logic program. Okay. And because you also have probabilities, actually what you get is a problem log program, which I, I've seen this mentioned a few times now in this workshop, so I, I will assume you know what it is, but I will give examples later. Um, so so what is the, the, the result of this whole uh, effort? So this is what I, I want to get. This is what I wanted to, to, to get at. Um, so the reasoner, so we, we have a data set of labeled arguments, good and bad arguments, and going through the pipeline, it gives you 87, oops, 87 uh, F1. Uh, if you assume the, 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 the labeling is correct, so, so it's pretty good, right? We, we haven't looked at what happens when there is disagreements. What is a disagreement? Uh, uh, the annotator said this is a bad argument, but the system said it's a good argument. Okay, there is 87%, uh, 87 F1 agreement between these things. But when it's the, when there's a difference of opinion, we don't know exactly what happens. Um, and what, what is human to human agreement so that we would be able uh, to evaluate the good question. standard number? Yeah, good question. So I don't know, but uh, humans have a hard time labeling these things. So this might be even better than in the human. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It may be, but actually this is a hard problem. And it's not hard for humans only, but it's hard for GPT. So we try uh, a GPT solution, try prompts and try you know, many things and it gets 68% F1. So it, what is the, the task here? You give the text to GPT and say, is this a good argument or not? Well, we don't ask this simple, but uh, the prompt is not this simple, but basically that's the question. So it does, it does make sense to have a pipeline. Right, uh, because you do get more structure, you do get uh, understanding about the components, you do, do get understanding of attacks and supports, uh, and you you do get better, even though it's hard to know. And I think that's that's one thing I want to say. That's the the yellow thing here. It's always hard to say GPT cannot do this because maybe there's a chain of thought system, or maybe there's some other thing that you could do that would improve the LLM, right? So I think there's not so there's mutualism in, in, in the the pipeline, but there's also competition in the way we do things now. Because we don't really know whether GPT would do better. So we have to do everything with GPT. We do the pipeline and then we have to do everything else. Right? We'd have to do things twice. Uh, it would be nice to know, okay, uh, these are the modules that are better in with one tool, and these are the modules that are better with best with another tool. But uh, we don't have that understanding still. So basically, we have to do things uh, twice. Um, let me. What well, one quick question? So yeah. uh, if you talk GPT, right? So maybe even with GPT, you can have I don't know ten or twenty retrials, and every time you would yeah. get a little bit different uh, uh, response usually, right? right. So uh, could you comment on this 
methodolo methodological uh, kind of approach. Yeah, so so yeah, that's a good point. And I I don't have to ask Victor, but mm -hmm. uh, I think he just ran through uh, he tried different prompts, and when he, he got satisfied with one prompt, he just tried once. Mm -hmm. uh, which is something that could be improved still. Um so let me just say a few things about the reasoner, right? So the thing is we we had we had to to build all this machinery to to take the text and trans transform text into uh, symbolic uh, objects. Uh, these are the arguments, the text, the supports, and they are attached to probabilities as well, because everything comes from the, the LLMs. Um, so we use this formalism. This is the formalism of uh, uh, probabilistic logic programming, where you have uh, facts that may be associated with probabilities, and then you have rules. Okay, like I said, I, I believe many people here know this syntax, which is problem syntax, but in case you don't know, basically it's, it's very simple. So there's a probability of half that A is true, a probability of half that B is true. And because C is the conjunction of A and B, the probability of C is true is 0.25. Okay, this problem is easy enough. So, but you can, you can um, build larger programs, of course. So, um, and, and some of these programs may have cycles. And so if you don't have a cycle, <clears throat> if you have just a bunch of uh, probabilistic facts and, uh, and rules, all you have is basically a Bayesian network. Okay, that's, that's basically what you have. If you have cycles, and this is this example here, you have a cycle, right? So engineer appears here and here, and lawyer appears here and here. So there's a, a cycle in the program. When you have a cycle that is associated with negation, uh, people may know this, but you may have, you don't have a semantics in problem. Okay, so problem doesn't deal with such such things. So this is one thing we we have to have in argumentation, and that's that's one thing that I think makes the argumentation challenge a lot more interesting than other problems, because you do have cycles, you do have even things that contradict it, itself, right themselves. <clears throat> So, and then you need semantics for these things and you need to study and you need to know what's going on. And I think this is this is a nice thing about the symbolic approach, right? You know, you have to know what's going on. You have to understand. There are several tools um, that we can use to handle these probabilistic logic programs that may have cycles, okay? Uh, some of them have been cited by, mentioned by uh, Benjamin, so I will not repeat all that. So it's, it's very well uh, covered already. Um, when you have probabilistic logic programming with neural networks providing the probabilities, you have a few possible tools. Uh, one tool is called deep, deep problem. If you know problem, you probably know deep problem. Deep problem is a version of problem where the probabilistic facts may have may have probabilities coming from neural networks. So it's very handy. Um, there's another tool called Neurasp that puts together logic programming in, in, in neural networks. But as far as I know, they don't deal with probabilities. And then we, we, have, uh, we have built a, a tool ourselves for getting things uh, under control and, and trying to understand the, the, the complexity of things. Um, one thing that our tool does is to deal with cycles, which is something that Deep Problem, Deep Problem does not do. And Renato is, is the person who did this, this tool. <clears throat> Uh, the tool is called DeepASP, right? So in a sense, this talk is, is being very uh, parallel to what Brad, Brad said, because she gave uh, the uh, number of applications and the tool. <laughs> and I'm, I'm following the same uh, uh, approach here, the same, same line. So this is a famous example in probabilistic logic program. <clears throat> programming. You basically, you have uh, training data, that gives you two MNIST images with numbers. And they you, you want to build a network that will recognize, classify one image, but you're not given the label of one image. You're given the, the, the label that gives you the sum of the two images. You see what I mean? So you never saw that this is a two. You only saw that these two images give an eight. That's, that's what you're given. Actually, it's possible to train one big convolutional ne uh, neural network to learn to classify one image from, from two images, from this, this data. 
But if you give some information to the to the system that okay, the label is the sum of the things you 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 have to label, then it's a lot easier. And uh, so this is how you give this information in DPAS. So you say that the probability of the digits come from a neural network, and there's a uh, there's a summation, right? So you're saying that this. These labels have to, to add to the label that you're getting. Um, so this is uh, these are some experiments. The the orange line, uh, the orange curve here, is learning one neural network uh, without no without with no knowledge that the the labels add uh, add to the label to the numbers add to the label that you get. And then you have uh, other curves for other curves for situations where you have the information. That you're you're adding the numbers, and this is this is uh, the problem Rasp, and DeepBasp. Our system is a little uh, faster, and the reason is we do things a little different. So if you know problem you know the problem compiles everything, right? So this makes uh, inference a lot uh, faster if you have a complex program with many probabilistic facts. But I think, and this is sort of um, intuition. I think that in neuro symbolic programs, what you want is a few neural networks. So you have a few probabilistic facts. This is an assumption. If that assumption is true, then there are better things to do than compiling the program. And this is what DPASP does. Okay, instead of compiling, it runs Klingo many times. So it's not reaching 100%. Is that based on the, the actual classic, um, you know, ability to classify those uh, images as the underlying digits or as the same worst going on? Uh, no, no, it's it's reaching, uh, you know, it's reaching a pretty high accuracy. Well, yes, but yeah, one hundred percent seems like it should be reachable. So, are, are those bad images, or is, is there some excuse for that, or not? Well, but even even if you get NIST, even if you just have all the information for, I don't think you get it one hundred percent. Yeah, that was the uh, question. It would be good on these slides to know what. Uh, oh, I see. NIST performance was okay because right? yes. that, that's what's, I think uh, NIST goes up to ninety-seven or something. So it's. It's worse than 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 MST, uh, pure MST. Uh and and then of course one one good thing about having uh, a language like uh, uh, probabilistic logic programming to express the knowledge you may have in our case it was argumentation right in this example was addition okay uh, but one good thing is that you can you can study the complexity of inferences and the uh, the cost of doing things. And, and we know a lot about these programs. We know the complexity. We know what to expect when you do inference. Uh, when I was preparing the talk, I thought, oh, this is funny. I had a, a part of the talk with a table with numbers. This was a neural part. And now I have a, a table with uh, complexity classes. This is a symbolic part. So there are two things there. So, uh, But you know, for example, that some inferences are very hard. Right, so if you have a program, it's propositional, and it's in, in like Benjamin mentioned this. It's in the second level of the polynomial arc, so it may feel like, oh my God, this is impossible. But actually, I would argue the other way around. Uh, it's more expressive. You can express things with short programs, with short constraints, that you would have to work very hard to do with sets. Right, um, and this is the thing we're doing now. Okay, so this is very. I mean, this is happening now, so I'll, I'll just be very quick. I don't know if I still have time. So you have like three, four minutes. Okay, so I'll take one minute. So this is what's happening now. We're trying to use uh, these programs, these probabilistic logic programs, to uh, express semantic loss. Uh, if, you, if you're familiar with semantic loss, it's, uh, it's uh, an approach to encoding knowledge into the loss, uh, the, the loss function, that has been proposed by uh, Given the Brock and his group. It's they have a very nice uh, package uh, uh, out there called Pylon, where you can express constraints. The constraints are turned into a loss, and it's so very close to what was presented before in the, in the second talk. That uh, it's, it's, it's the, the idea is you have knowledge and you turn into the loss, right? You transform into the loss. Um, the constraints that are dealt with by uh, Pylon, as far as I know. I know he is around, so he may contradict me on the spot. But as far as I know, it's uh, these are Boolean constraints. It's basically set uh, satisfiability problems. But if you have a, a more 
powerful language, a more expressive language, of course, it's, it's complexity is higher, but you can do things with very short programs that would be very hard to do with science. For example, you can, uh, you can express problems such as strategic sets, which is it's a very common problem. Uh, it's a logistics problem. You have a set of things, you want to find a subset that maximizes a few, uh, few properties. I, will, I don't think I have time to go into this, but you can use this program as a semantic loss. Right, so and this is a lot more expressive. If I had to to express this using Boolean uh, constraints, I, I would be lost. I mean, it would be really difficult. And and Leonardo, who is here, is exploring this uh, and, and building semantic losses with more complicated uh, uh, programs expressed in probabilistic logic programming. Uh, this, like I said, this last part is really work in progress. You can. You can look at the software, you can see a tutorial, but this is really uh, happening now. So let me finish. I maybe have uh, one minute still, something like this. Um, so I hope I, I was able to convince you that argumentation is a nice thing, a nice setting for neurosymbolic uh, uh, approaches, okay? Uh, argumentation has everything. You have to do argument mining, you have to reason, you have to justify, there are probabilities all over the place. Arguments are sometimes uncertain, right? When you extract things, you're, you're left with probabilities. So, and it's very tough. So GPT-like approaches do not do well, okay? Um, so it's worth looking at settings such as this. Um, and if I, perhaps I, I was um, successful in, in conveying this, this message. Um, and I think, <clears throat> When you're doing such things, you, you do need basic languages, basic formalisms to help you. Um, and I try to, to say a few things about uh, probabilistic logic programs. Is it one possible formalism? There are maybe others. Okay, but I think this one is, is worth looking at. And we have this package that we're trying to build um, to, to do not only argumentation, but semantic losses and similar things. Okay, so uh, let me finish. Thanks for the attention. Uh, this work has been sponsored by a number of, uh, of uh, organizations, uh, which I'm thankful, thankful for. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. So, if we have time for one question. Okay. We need the one. Yeah, because people are on Zoom also, so they cannot hear you. Um, great talk. I fully agree that our meditation needs to be sent to your networks and vice versa. And we did some work on value-based augmentation framework that this is strikingly close to what we're achieving using uh, that's that I call probabilistic augmentation framework. So what I want to say is that uh, you are uh, seemingly spot on or something that we, I remember that uh, that was 10 years ago, getting old. And we use very simple in forward with one layer and we're able to compute some certain concepts in argumentation like accrual, like self defeating arguments. And uh, I just want to say that the work is, is very good and neatly fits into the framework of Neurosquad AI. We have a, some theoretical results on that and I'm very excited to, to see it happening. Thank you. Okay, that was a good question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. So, thank you. All right, thanks.